The title of my talk is The Thousand Brains Theory of Intelligence. At my company, Nementa, we study um, two things. One is we study how the brain works, specifically the neocortex. And we want to understand that from a biological point of view, but we really also want to take what we've learned about the brain and apply it to AI and machine intelligence. So that's what our mission is. That's what we are doing. And uh, today I'm going to tell you about the progress we've made in understanding how the brain works and how that will affect the future of AI. But mostly I'll be talking about uh, the brain and what it is a brain does and how it creates intelligence. So let's just jump into it. Um, I'm going to start with this, uh, this article that was written back in 1979 by the famous scientist Francis Crick called Thinking About the Brain. And he made the observation, even back then, that neuroscientists or scientists had a huge amount, collected a huge amount of data about the brain. We knew all kinds of facts, but we didn't really have any understanding about how it worked. And his observation was that perhaps we don't need more facts, we just need a new way of thinking about it. So that was in the subtitle of this article, that we need a new way of thinking about the information we already had. Somehow the brain was doing something we weren't, just didn't understand it correctly. Later on in the article, he wrote, what is conspicuously lacking is a framework of ideas within which to interpret all the different approaches, meaning all the different uh, pieces of knowledge we had. And that's what I'm gonna to present today. Um, I'm gonna to present a, a way of thinking about the brain and explaining how, what it does and how it does it that is consistent with um, all of the known facts about the brain. So let's just start with the, a picture of the human brain. Um, and that's the neocortex. It's, it's the big sheet of cells, the wrinkly sheet of cells that wraps around the top of your brain. It's about the size of a large dinner napkin, maybe 1,500 centimeters. And in a human, it's about two and a half millimeters thick. Now, this is clearly the organ of intelligence in humans. Uh, animals have various levels of intelligence, and not all of them have a neocortex. But in humans and mammals, this is the organ of intelligence. Um, there's a couple of things we can say about it. Um, it's the primary organ for responsible for all of our sensory perception. So when we see something uh, and we recognize what it is, or we touch something, or we hear something, um, it's the neocortex that's understanding that impulse. It also is the primary um, creator of our motor behavior. So when we move our limbs or we, we manipulate tools, uh, such as picking up a, a physical tool or maybe using your smartphone, or when we create language, it's the neocortex that does this. My neocortex is creating my speech right now and yours is understanding it. And it's also the organ of all thought or abstract thought. So when we think about math or science or philosophy or neuroscience, it's the neocortex that's doing that. Now it has some remarkable attributes. Um, first of all, it learns continuously. It never stops learning uh, throughout our lives we're always learning new things. We walk into a new room, we quickly learn the, the format of the room. Or if I get a, a, new, uh, a new tool, uh, I'll learn how to use that. Or I pick up a new object. Or if I get a new app on my smartphone, I can learn it very rapidly and continuously. I never stop learning. Um, we're just always picking up new pieces of our environment all the time. Um, it learns rapidly. Uh, unlike most artificial neural networks today, uh, you, you generally can be exposed to something once and you'll remember it. Um, and so it's not like we have this very long uh, training period. We just quickly pick up things. We say, oh, this is there, this is that, this person said this, and so on. And we incorporate this knowledge into our, into our model of the world. It's very efficient. The, the neocortex, or the brain is, as a whole, consumes about 20 watts, which is a very low power. And this is despite the fact that it's made up of very slow elements. Neurons themselves can't process very quickly. Um, the fastest they can do anything is about five milliseconds. So we have the system that's made of a very slow elements, uses very low power, yet is extremely powerful. Um, and so that's a, a wonderful mystery. And perhaps the most important thing is its flexibility, its extreme flexibility. Each of us learns uh, to do thousands of different types of tasks in our lives, whether we program or use computers or we learn how to drive a car, even simple things like how to open windows and clean them or how to plant um, vegetables and flowers in your garden. We can learn almost anything. And um, we all learn, we're just tremendously flexible. We're not limited in what we can do. 
And we see the parallels between different activities. So we generalize well between different activities. Now, it, it, it should be mentioned that today's AI um, is not nearly as capable as a human brain. Uh, it doesn't do most of the things that we're able to do. And, and it's not even close. And it, of course, it, these, the systems we have today, are they don't learn continuously, they don't learn quickly, they take huge amounts of power, um, and, and they don't generalize, they're not flexible. So the brain is, is doing something completely, very, very different than today's AI. So here's the outline of my talk. First, I'm gonna talk about what the neocortex does and the way to think about it. And that is it learns a model of the world. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about how that model is constructed. First, that it's, it's a highly distributed model and it learns through movement. And then the third point here is how it learns um, a model of the world using something called reference frames. And I'll explain this. And then how do we know these reference frames exist because they're derivatives of some other cells called grid cells and place cells. So hopefully uh, this will be um, easy to follow. It's a little bit of neuroscience, but that's very interesting. So let's just talk about what the neocortex does. It's tempting to think of the neocortex as like a computer, like it gets some input and processes it and gets some output. Or if you're using one of the new chat AI systems, you type in a query and it gives you an answer. But that's not the right way to think about it. The, the brain, what its main purpose is, is to learn a model of the world, to create a, an internal representation of the world that's outside. And that's what we do when we learn. Subsequently, we use that model for various things. We can use that model to recognize things, you know where we are. We can use that model for planning and so on. But the goal of the system is to learn an, uh, a, a representation of the world, an internal model of the world. That's its first and foremost goal. Then subsequently, we use that model to do things. Now, the number of things you know about the world is huge. It's very large. We know thousands of physical objects, how they look and feel and sound. Uh, we know that objects are composed of other objects. Take something as simple as a bicycle. A bicycle is composed of a frame and wheels and pedals and a chain and a seat and so on. Um, and each of those are composed of other objects. So we have this sort of hierarchical mo model of objects of objects. We also learn where objects are located relative to each other. This is part of our model. So uh, if I go into a room and I see chairs and a table, I not just see them as a list of objects, but I see where they are relative to each other. Same with a bicycle. A bicycle is not just a set of components. There are wheels are in positions relative to the frame, positions relative to the seat, and so on. We have to learn those relative positions. And objects in the world have behaviors. Um, take your smartphone, you bring up an app. When you touch it, certain things you expect to happen, certain things, you know, how you swipe, what happens if you go this way, what happens if you push a button? Or the bicycle, what happens when you turn the handlebars? How do the brakes work? Well, how do you, what happens when you pedal and change gears and so on? And part of our model of the world is how objects behave. We have to understand how the brain can represent that information. And then finally, the, the model of our world includes things which are not physical. They're not, they're more abstract, such as what's a, a, you know, math or what's the definition of democracy. So we have these, this very complex model of the world and it's all in our neocortex. And of course, as I said earlier, we use these models to create goal-oriented behaviors. Once you have a model of how things work, you can say, well, I want to accomplish something. Given my model of the world, what would be the best actions, most likely actions that would lead to the result I want? And that's the whole goal of the neocortex is to have the basic goal-oriented behavior, but you need this internal model first. And finally, I would say the model is predictive. Uh, this is important to understand both how it works and how we discovered how it works. Um, um, when I say it's predictive, it means that it's constantly predicting what it's going to experience next. It's something as simple as, uh, as I've touched something, my brain's going to, my neocortex is going to predict what it's going to touch. Or if I see something, it's going to predict what I see. When I walk into a familiar room, if I look left, I expect to see one thing. If I look right, I expect to see the other thing. This prediction is occurring all the time. Um, we're not generally aware of it, but we know that it's occurring because if anything in the world changes, um, you'll notice it. And that's proof that the brain is making a prediction. So even if you're not thinking about something, if something feels different or looks different, you immediately your attention is drawn to it. And that tells you that the brain is making a prediction about that. And one of the reasons the brain does this, one of the advantages of it, it uses prediction as a training signal. 
Um, so when we have a model of the world, if something is wrong, the prediction is incorrect, the brain knows to attend to that thing and it says, this part of my model is incorrect. Let's learn that part of the world. Let's see what's different. How did, how did I get this wrong? And so we don't train ourselves just by throwing a million images in front of us or doing things a million times. We built this model up incrementally. We have a model, we make predictions, the predictions are incorrect, and we fix the model and so on. Now, how is this all implemented in the brain and in the neocortex? And so we're gonna dive a little bit into the neuroscience here. Um, and we're gonna talk about something called the cortical columns. This is how the neocortex is structured. This upper image represents a sort of artistic drawing of, of a, a small piece of the neocortex. So this is, uh, and it's showing it's organized into these columns. Um, and the neocortex, as I mentioned earlier, is about two and a half millimeters thick. And these columns are roughly about a millimeter in diameter. Um, so now if you actually were to look under a, a microscope at the neocortex, you wouldn't see these columns like this. They're not visible like this, but we know they exist. And I'll explain why in a second. In a human, if we assume that the columns are about a millimeter in diameter, then we have about 150,000 of them in our neocortex. So that's how your neocortex is organized into the 150,000 of these columns um, that, as you'll see in a moment, are remarkably the same. They look very similar everywhere. So uh, this is a repetitive element that the neocortex is built with. Now, how do we know that columns exist? Um, there's a lot of evidence. I'll just show an image here from uh, a paper that was published in 1997 by Vernon Mountcastle, and just gives you the idea of it here. In this image, there are shown six columns in the cortex and the experimenter uh, put a probe through them horizontally at an angle down. You can see the line coming down diagonally and it crosses through different parts, you know, th horizontally through the neocortex. And, and then you can see that the inputs to these columns are coming from different patches of skin on the hand of the case of a monkey. And so when they put the probe in, they would notice that all the cells seem to respond to one patch of skin and that occurs then after about a millimeter of travel, um, they all switch over, the cells start responding to a different patch of skin for about a millimeter. And then, and then after a millimeter, they switch to another patch of skin. So the columns are defined by the fact that all the cells in a particular column are getting input from the same sensory patch, if you will. And, um, and then the next column over from a different sensory patch. That's, that, that general idea, applies throughout the, the, the neocortex and the visual system and the auditory system, and even higher levels, which is a little bit difficult to imagine at first, but this is the general organization of the neocortex. Now, when scientists first started looking internal to the brain, looking at what does the, the neocortex look like? What do these columns look like? Um, they started making pictures like this. This goes back a long time to the, uh, 1899 uh, um, uh, from a famous scientist at Cajal. And here you're kind of looking at an image of, of the cells in uh, a small uh, region of cortex. And again, it's two and a half millimeters thickness across the, all the regions. And so um, on the left image, you can see the different, some of the cell bodies, and you can see there are different densities and different sizes. And this led to the idea that there are different layers of cells in the neocortex. So now scientists talk about there's different layers of cells that cut across the two and a half millimeter. But if you look at the connections between the cells, that's in the rightmost image, you see that most of the connections go vertically. So most of the information flows up and down across the two and a half millimeters, up and down within a column between the different layers of cells. This is what most of the processing occurs. It comes into a column, gets processed up and down, and then eventually it'll go someplace else. But most of the connections are vertical like that. Scientists like ourselves, we make diagrams that look like this. Now there are literally thousands of papers that have been published on the architecture of the neocortex. It's a very detailed and complex um, area of science, but we can try to just give you a summary of what it looks like, something like this, where you have different cell types. They um, connect to each other, some in, in one direction, some bi-directional, they have different attributes and so on. Um, I'll make just a few very high level observations. First of all, columns are complex in a, in a Square millimeter neocortex, there's about 100,000 neurons, about 500 million synapses. There are dozens of different cell types, and, 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 and they're, they're connected in various prototypical circuits 
So there's a very complex circuit. It's not just a big mess of wires. It's very organized. Um, and there's actually something called mini columns. I mean, there's hundreds of mini columns inside of each column. So we can surmise that whatever columns do is also complex. Now, I mention this because uh, some AI researchers treat the cortex as doing simple things like just feature extraction, but there's much more is going on here. This is a very complex circuitry um, that's doing something complex. Another surprising thing is that all columns have a motor output. You, there's a layer of cells which project someplace in the brain that makes something move. So even the parts of the cortex that get input directly from the eyes, um, they have cells which project back to the part of the brain that moves the eyes. And so um, you, the, the part that's processing the input from the eyes is also directing how the eyes should move. Um, and that's a common feature everywhere. The, the part that gets input from your ears uh, directs how your head and its angle is changing. So when you change, move your head, you change what you hear, just like when you move your eyes, you change what you see. So this is, a, as far as you know, a universal property of the neurocortex. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, what is perhaps most surprising is that all the columns are remarkably similar. The columns that are processing vision look like the columns that are processing touch and the columns that are processing language. But they're not identical. There are some small chain differences, but by and large, they have the same overall architecture, which is surprising. So Vernon Mountcastle, again, the same scientist I mentioned earlier, he wrote a paper, a famous paper in 1979, and he made the following speculations. He said, look, the reason the columns look similar is because they perform the same intrinsic function. They're all doing the same thing. Somehow vision is the same as touch, which is the same as hearing, which is the same as language. Not obvious, but that's what the neuroscience is telling us. And then he went on to say, well, what it does is what it's connected to. So if you take a bunch of columns and connect them to the eyes, you get vision. If you take, connect them to the ears, you get hearing. If you connect them to the skin, you get touch. And if you take a bunch of columns and outputs and connect them to other columns, you get things like high-level thought and language. So he made the observation, well, if we could understand what a column does, um, that would be really important. As he said, would have great generalizing significance. So this is, in some sense, uh, a major quest of neuroscience is to understand how columns, what they do and how they work. And we think we figured out basically what's going on here. And that's the essence of the theory that I'm about to tell you about. So what does a column do? Uh, let me just start with a, a little thought experiment, which is how we sort of broke through on this and, and had a real uh, discovery about this. One day I was holding um, a Nementa coffee cup, this one, and I was touching it with my hand. And of course, if I touch my, just with one finger on the cup, um, and as I move it around the cup, my brain makes a prediction what it's going to feel. So as I move my finger, my finger um, it will predict, oh, in this case, oh, it's going, to have to, it's going to feel the rounded side of the cup. And if I move my finger to the top of the cup and touch the rim, it'll make a different prediction. Most of the time, you're not, it, you wouldn't be familiar, you wouldn't be aware of these predictions, but you can think about it. And as your finger's moving, you can anticipate what it's going to feel like. That was an interesting observation. It says, well, how does, it, how does my brain know what it's going to feel before it actually gets to the edge of the cup in this case? And um, you can do this without looking. You don't have to be looking at the cup. You can do this in the dark. So it's not like, oh, I see what I'm going to feel. No. It tells you that the brain has a model of the cup, and it knows where my finger is on the cup, and it knows where my finger will be after it's finished moving. It needs to know that to make a prediction. So that was interesting because it means the brain is tracking the location of my finger relative to this object as I'm touching it. Now I can touch the object with multiple fingers at the same time. So here I'm grabbing the cup with my thumb and my index finger and my other fingers in the back. In each patch of skin that's touching the cup has its own prediction about what it will feel. And if it felt something different, you'd know right away. If there was a rough patch or a crack or something was not rounded and was more like an edge, you would notice this. So the brain is cast to keep track of the location of each patch of skin that's touching the cup and checking it against its model of the cup, saying, what am I expected to feel as my fingers move around this cup? So this led to the following conclusions. Uh, to predict what you'll feel, the neocortex must, must know the location of each patch of skin relative to the cup, which is a surprising thing if you think about it. And to know a location requires a reference frame. Now, reference frame, uh, we're all familiar with them. You could think of a reference frame as like the X, Y, and Z coordinates. Uh, 
Cartesian coordinate three learned in school. Um, it's a way of keeping track of the location or specifying the location of something. So the brain has to have a reference frame that's keeping track of the location of every patch of my skin that's touching this um, cup. And that reference frame is relative to the cup. It's not relative to my body or to something else. It's relative to the cup. So this is a surprising thing. So how did the brain do this? How did neurons actually do this? But this is not, you can, it's logically determined. So it's not really speculation. It has to be doing this. Stuff. So this was a big insight for us. Um, and so then we, we, we developed a theory based on this. We published this theory in a paper called a theory of how columns in your cortex enable learning of the structure of the world. And this theory can be summarized in a few slides here. Um, here's a, a, a cartoon image of a finger touching at the cup and the green arrow represents the sensation input that's going into a column in the neocortex. That's a column that's, rep, that's capturing the input from the finger. So that's the sense feature that's coming in, but it's gonna be paired with the location. So there's gonna be another layer of cells that's representing the location of the finger relative to the cup. And so I can now, if my finger moves around the cup, I have different locations and different sensations. And this column can learn a model of the cup. It can learn the shape or morphology of a cup uh, or any object that it's touching by sensing and moving and sensing and moving by pairing a location with a sensation, which is that blue arrow. The blue arrow is basically learning how to make these, uh, what, what the different features are at different locations on the cup. So uh, this is a, a part of what we propose that there'd be these reference frames in every cortical column. But now what happens when you have multiple fingers touching the cup? Um, oh, I should mention here, there's, um, you can then define an object. The object is just essentially another layer of cells would represent the object, which is essentially the collection of all sense features and locations. So imagine now I have three fingers uh, touching the cup. And uh, so we have multiple columns. Well, at first you might make the observation that each finger is at a different location. So each finger is going to a different column and each column has its own location relative to the cup. In fact, each column has its own model of the cup. There are now three models of this cup coming into these different um, sensory patches. Uh, and, and the brain has to keep track of the location of each finger because they can move somewhat independently. But something else is going on here. When I when I reach in, if I touch the cup with a full hand, I may not have to move my fingers around to actually recognize the cup. So what's going on is that columns can talk to each other uh, to what we call voting. There are connections here, these horizontal green arrows I've shown here. There are these long range connections that go between columns. Uh, these are very well documented. Um, and we propose what they're doing is, is they're allowing the columns to vote. They're basically saying each column has a sort of partial knowledge about the world. Each one's saying, well, I'm touching something. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I might have a guess it's a coffee cup, but it might be something else. And by co collaborating, they can all come to a common agreement at once. They can say, yeah, we all agree this is a cup. Um, and that's, that is what you perceive. It's like, okay, yes, there are many models here, but I now, everyone knows it's a coffee cup. Now, this perhaps is somewhat obvious. When you think about touch, you can think about your fingers moving independently, but the same process is going on in vision. And this is not so obvious. The way to think about vision is your brain doesn't look at an image of the world. Uh, this is well known to neuroscientists. It's not like that. Um, in some sense, well, what is actually happening is the cortex has different columns. Each column is getting input from a different patch of the retina. And so each patch of the retina is like a different finger in some sense. Each patch of the retina is looking at a different location in the world. And each patch of the retina is trying to model or uh, understand what it's looking at. And they vote together. So vision works the same way, uh, although it may not be obvious to you. Uh, one way you can perhaps make it a little bit more obvious, imagine looking at the world through a straw. And so you can only see a little bit of the world at once. This is like touching the world with a single finger. You can still learn what objects look like by moving the straw around, and you can still recognize objects by moving the straw around. That would be like touching and recognizing something with a single finger. But if you look at the world through your entire retina, it's like grabbing an object with all your fingers at once. And, and now you can recognize what it is. So this led to a very interesting question from a neuroscientist's point of view is, how is it that neurons, these cells, can represent reference frames to know where the location of something is? Um, if, if you know anything about brains, this is puzzling. And it was puzzling to us. But we, we concluded this must be happening. The answer wasn't so hard, actually. Um, turns out there are. Um, 
there's a part of the brain that's not in the neocortex. Um, that there are these two parts called the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex. In the humans, they're very in the center of the brain, about the size of your small finger. Uh, and there's these cells in the entorhinal cortex called grid cells that um, are known to form a type of reference frame for environments. Um, and so when an animal, is typically a rat, um, moves around in a, an environment like a box or a maze, these grid cells in the entorhinal cortex sort of represent where the animal is. Um, there's other cells in the hippocampus called place cells, which are uh, also represent where the animal is, but more based on sensory information. So that's a sort of a pairing of location and sensory input. Um, and these two uh, cell types uh, have been very well studied. And so what we speculated was that the neocortex would use a similar mechanism. It would have something equivalent to grid cells and it was something equivalent to place cells. Uh, so uh, that's what we proposed in a series of papers, that there would be grid cells and place cells equivalents in every cortical column in the neocortex. And these would create reference frames for objects. Here's, a, here's another image just to help you get, understand what I'm talking about here. In the left picture, there's a, a cartoon of a rat moving around in, a, in an environment. And I've labeled three locations there, D, E, and F. And grid cells represent where the rat is. So when the rat is at location D, the, the grid cells have a certain firing pattern. And um, the, when the rat's at location E, they have a different cell firing pattern. And if the rat goes back to D, no matter how it gets there, what direction and so on, it's gonna the same sort of cells will be firing. So these grid cells represent locations in the environment as a reference frame. What we're proposing is that in the cortex, something almost the same thing is happening, but instead of tracking the location of your body in a room, like the rat, that we're tracking the location of a sensory patch, like with your finger. And so as your finger moves over the coffee cup, it's the same as the rat moving around in the room. There are grid cells representing the location of the finger relative to the coffee cup. And, and so like every time you get to a location on the rim labeled X, those same cells are being active. So now that we put this together, we can, we can basically make this, this a, a very simple version of it. It's, not, it's more complicated than this, but we can say that there's a layer of cells in each cortical column which we would call cortical grid cells. This is the reference frame representing where a sensory input is, and then be somewhat of equivalent to play cell, which is the sense features at a location. Um, and therefore, the, each cortical column is modeling something in the world just the same way as grid cells and play cells. Now, we made this prediction. Um, and when we made this prediction, it was not known that there are grid cells in the neocortex. Uh, but you'll see in a moment, there's lots of evidence for that now. Back right here. Um, there's growing evidence for this, uh, and, and I'm not going to walk you through this experiment. It's a very complex experiment, but I want just to give you a flavor that people are, are doing these things. So there's now a lot of evidence there are grid cells in human neocortex and other animals' neocortex as well. This is a, a, an experiment that was done using humans in fMRI, one of those machines that can detect where activity is in the brain. And humans were asked to train to do, uh, think about birds. In this case, the birds had, were different, differed by the lengths of their necks and their legs. And so what the scientists were able to show um, is that, the, uh, that when we thought about, when a human thought about birds and thought of like, oh, what would a bird be like? Or how would I organize them and sort them and things like that, that they were able to show that the neocortex is using uh, grid cells to organize knowledge about the bird. It's exactly what I was just talking about. Um, so grid cells form the basis for knowledge. In this case, <clears throat> when they, people learned about birds, it was forming the basis for knowledge about birds. And um, it's very clever experiments. There are now uh, numerous experiments show that there are grid cell-like um, cells throughout the neocortex. Uh, so this is a, a good confirmation, at least, of the major proposal of this theory. There's one more part about the brain I want to mention. Um, before we, we wrap up here. And that it brain is generally viewed as a hierarchical system. It's, and, and so is most AI systems. So let's talk about that. In this case, um, on the left here is a very simplified view of how people often think about the brain. You get input from, say, from the eye, from the retina. It goes to a region called V1, which extracts simple features, then to another region called V2, which extracts more complex features, and so on, until you get to a, a region that you can recognize an object. 
And today's AI systems are largely, the deep learning networks largely are based on this idea. Although in deep learning networks, instead of having three or four layers like in a, in a human brain, they have maybe a hundred layers. So it's the it's, it's same idea, but much more depth to the models. Um, but when you look at an actual brain, which is the set image in the middle of the, uh, the slide, um, it doesn't look very hierarchical at all. Now this very complex image is actually famous for neuroscientists. Every neuroscientist knows this image. And, and what it represents is a monkey's brain. The little boxes are, the little rectangles are different regions of the monkey's neocortex. And so there's dozens of them here. And then um, the lines represent how they're connected together. So you can make a few observations. First of all, this does not look like a simple hierarchy and it isn't. In fact, most of the connections that are observed in the brain are not hierarchical like in a flow chart. They're, they kind of go all over the place. Another way of putting that is that more than 40% of all the possible connections between regions exist, which is not something you'd see in the hierarchy. Another surprising result is some of the, the, some of the regions, the ones that get direct input from the eyes or the ears or the skin, these are the largest regions in the neocortex, which is surprising because if you, most people think that they're just extracting some sort of feature or some, some simple feature extraction, why would those be the largest regions, whereas the other higher level regions are smaller? And, um, and then also that we find even regions of the brain that get direct input from the eyes, such as V1, they also are, they get influenced by what we hear and what we touch. So they're multimodal, which doesn't make sense in a hierarchy either. But all these things do make sense in the thousand brains theory uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, here's a way to think about it. Um, in the thousand brains theory of intelligence, there isn't a single model of something like a coffee cup. There are actually thousands of models of a coffee cup. They're not identical, they're complementary. They exist in different cortical columns. I'm not saying that every cortical column has a model of the coffee cup, that's not true, but there are many models of the coffee cup. And um, there are models that represent what the coffee cup looks like, and there are models that represent what the coffee cup feels like. And most of the connections in the brain are for voting between the columns. So when I see the coffee cup, I can imagine what it's going to feel. And I feel the coffee cup, I can imagine what it's going to see. Or if I have a very impoverished view of something and I touch it, I'll be able to figure out what it is and so on. So those are represented by these blue arrows here. And we also have models at different scales. Um, so the way to think about the cortex is there's these thousands of models of everything and they're voting all the time uh, on what's going on. Now there is a hierarchy, there's still hierarchy in the brain. We've, we know that's true. Some of the connections are hierarchical, but they're not just passing features. They're passing uh, models. So, you know, a, a bicycle, as I mentioned earlier, is composed of wheels and, and chain and a frame and so on. So when we, when we build structured models of the world, we are learning models of models. And that's what the hierarchy uh, is, lets you do. It's not hierarchy of features, but hierarchy of models. So that's kind of wraps up the basic theory here. So let me just summarize. Uh, the thousand brain theory of intelligence. I'm really talking about biological intelligence so far. And the main key walkaways are the brain learns a model of the world. This is how you have to think about it. This is, don't think about the brain as performing some function. It's learning a model of the world. And it is a distributed model, meaning in the brain it's distributed over thousands of different cortical columns. And those models are learned by sensory motor integration. You can't, the brain cannot learn without movement. This is key to how we understand the world. Uh, the models then use reference frames to represent knowledge. So we don't just store a list of facts. We don't just store statistics. We build a structured model of the world using reference frames. And then the models vote to reach a consensus. This is the core of what's going on in your head um, and everyone else's head. Um, now, I'm gonna just state the following. Machine intelligence, uh, I believe, and I'm, I'm certain of this, that true machine intelligence must work on the same principles as the brain. These are not optional components. Uh, the AI we have today, uh, despite its, its really um, excellent performance on certain tasks and how, you know, how well it works, it doesn't really have the attributes we talked about earlier. It doesn't really know what it's doing. It's more, these are more statistical models they don't have structured knowledge of the world. They don't know how to act upon the world. They don't have a sense of how the world behaves and how we can generalize across models. These all require the reference frames and the distributed modeling system I've talked about here. So I, although we have a lot of great AI today, I don't believe it's gonna be the dominant technology going 
forward into the rest of this uh, century. I believe that machine intelligence will be based on, most of machine intelligence will be based on the principles I've laid out here. So it'll be the dominant AI technology of the 21st century. Uh, I'm very confident of that. Um, at my company, Nemento, we are, uh, we are working to make this happen. I'm happy to promote it, which is why I'm talking about it here. Um, we're trying to get other people working on this too, but um, this is doable. This is not something we have to wait. We know how to, we know how to do this today.